it's okay. Yeah. We have to be careful when we say Ajit, isn't it? Uh, this is Ajit. Hi, Ajit. Is Paili here? Uh, the one waving to you. All the others you see on the screen are our strong pillars here of Kerala Federation. We just finished the one function and we're just waiting for you to join. Then we will go ahead with the oration. Uh, before we officially start, thank you very much for accepting our this personally from me before I hand over to the officials who will conduct the proceedings. Uh, shall we just start? I have got your slides. I have passed, passed it on as a backup uh, to the people who control the events. Okay, Ajit. Thank you very much, Dr. Pali. It's my, my great honor. I will share from my screen, but yes, thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, sure. Okay. Deepthi, you can take over now. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcoming our esteemed faculty, Dr. Ajit Abraham and Dr. Nisha Bhatla, for the prestigious orations in AKCOG 2021. For the first time in all these 43 years, we are having it on a virtual platform, but we always believe the problems bring us possibilities as well. And that is why we are so happy to have here with us Dr. Ajit Abraham and Dr. Neeracha, which in another case would not have been possible. So thank you, uh, thanking both of you and welcoming you to Kerala. Respected KFOP president, president-elect, Dr. Paili, Dr. Shekharan sir, Dr. Yash Shekharan sir, and other senior members of the profession and their delegates. Now we are moving on to the orations of K K uh, AKCOG. These two orations are always close to our hearts because this is a memoriam of two great teachers, Dr. Krishna Menon and Dr. Tankam. So first we will have Dr. M.K. Krishnamenon Memorial Oration. May I now invite the chairpersons of the session. The first and foremost, Dr. V.P. Paili, past president of Kerala Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, state coordinator of Confidential Review of Maternal Deaths Kerala, at present consultant Rajagiri Hospital Alvi, had special interest in high-risk pregnancy, endoscopy, pelvic floor, and urogynecology. Above all, he is our pilot sir, our dearest teacher, a teacher to his teachers as well. May I now invite Dr. K. Ambujam, Professor and Head of the Department, Donman Medical College, Trishur, the outgoing President of Kerala Federation of ONG, who headed the KFOC during the most difficult time, 2020. She is at present Chairperson, Maternal Fetal Medicine Committee, member of the core committee of reducing MMR in Kerala, co-editor of the book, Why Mothers Die, two editions, a field of interest in high-risk obstetrics as well as adolescent health. She's also holding the prestigious position of the Dean of Faculty of Medicine of Kerala University of Health Sciences. Welcoming Madam to chair this session. And along with that, the ever dynamic Dr. Venu Gobal, a consultant ART specialist at AMC IVF Fertility Center based at Trishur. He's the Secretary General of Kerala Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Secretary Kerala Chapter IFS, and the convener of Anthrology. With these two, three chairpersons, we are now moving on to the oration. May I now invite Dr. Ampujam to talk about Dr. Krishna Menon. Over to you, ma'am. very good evening and warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Ajit Abraham. I am privileged to talk a few words about late Professor M.K. Krishnamanan. Padmasri Dr. M.K. Krishnamanan, BA, MD, FRCOG, FAMS, was born on 25th January 1908, had his education at Zamarin's College Calicut, Presidency College, and Madras Medical College, where he did his DGO and MD and finished out in 1938. Even before his post-graduation, he had been a research scholar and research fellow of the Madras University under Dr. Sir A. L. Mudaliar. During the Second World War, he joined the Indian Army as an emergency commissioned officer in the Indian Medical Service from July 1940 to December 1945. He served in various theaters of war and was released in December 1945 with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. 
Returning, he joined the Madras Medical Service and from December 1945 to 1957, he served in various capacities, starting from assistant professor to professor at Stanley Medical College, at Women and Children Hospital, Madras, Andhra Medical College, Visagapatnam, Madras Medical College, Stanley Medical College, and in 1957, he was appointed director and professor of Institute of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Madras Medical College, and obstetrician and gynecologist, Women and Children Hospital, Madras, from which post he retired in April 1970. He was appointed professor emeritus at the Institute. He was an inveterate scientist, and he contributed lytic cocktail therapy for eclampsia. Though superseded by magnesium sulfate today, this remained the standard of care internationally for a number of years. He delivered a lecture on the evolution of treatment of eclampsia at the University College Hospital London on 30th May 1960 by invitation of the London University. He became member of the expert committee of the WHO on maternal and child health. He was also a member, chairman of the ICMR subcommittee on maternal and child health human reproduction, fertility control. Government of India appointed him as a committee member on maternal child health, fertility control and medical education. He was also visiting professor at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Downstate Medical Center, State University of New York and Oxford University. He became president of Foxy and vice president of the Asian Federation of Ruby Gyne. In 1963, he was the president of the 12th all India Congress, which was held at Ahmedabad. He was the founder fellow of National Academy of Medical Sciences. In addition to many scientific publications in national and international journals, he is also a co-author along with Dr. Sir A. L. Mudliar of a textbook, Clinical Obstetrics. He was awarded the fellowship of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 1962. The President of India in 1973 awarded him Padma Shri. He was also awarded Honorary Fellowship of the Asian Oceania Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 1987. Leaving a big vacuum in the field of clinical obstetrics and gynecology, Padma Shri, Dr. M. K. Krishnamenon passed away at the age of 80 years in the year 1988. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for that introduction. May I now invite Dr. V.P. Paili to introduce our, the orator of the day, Dr. Ajit Abraham. Over to Paili, sir. Good evening. Dear friends, respected Dr. Ajit, our president of KFOG. Another Ajit is there, Ajit Abraham, uh, the president of KFOG this year. But with a little difference in the spelling, he is A-J-I-T-H, and you have cut short to A-J-I-T. Uh, Ajit, and uh, Jose, our Vice President from Kano, Venugopal, our Dynamic Secretary, Dr. Ambujam, who just introduced MK Kemenan, Deepthi, the compare, and my dear friends. Actually, I was just dreaming that we may get Ajit as our orator. And I should tell you how the whole thing happened. In February, Kerala government hosted the Kerala Health Webinar that was a request by actually us to the Kerala government to have something like that to showcase the achievement of the health front. And um, just before the election year, election day, the government of Kerala decided to execute that. And one of the sessions, Ajit was the guest speaker. I was, of course, presenting our achievements on the maternal fetal side because we had been doing the confidential audit of maternal deaths in the state of Kerala, just as they do it in the UK, which was very well known internationally. And because of our close association with the government of Kerala, the health department, I was asked to share our experience in the health front, especially maternal death audit to the world. And so I was listening every day to the proceedings. And on that day when trauma was the theme, Ajit was the speaker. And I was so impressed. I should say the style of your presentation, Ajit, 
the content of it and how good a speaker you was immediately i told my wife oh, here is a man by name he is a malayali and uh, we should get him and that is why i just thought of writing to you just to try our luck whether you will be able to come and deliver this oration and going through your cv then i found how uh, you were connected with kerala even though you were born in kana i should assume your parents would have been hailing from kerala and they would have been in kana as probably teachers or most of the time that is how most of our people are in africa at that time and um, to the to the information for everyone among you this ajit here has got all the degrees that a man can have he is of course mbbs ms and an ma ma in medical ethics and law and frcs and that too then went on to specialize hepato pancreato pancreatico biliary surgery liver transplant robotics whatever we can think about he has achieved all that and he is much more than that i will tell you in a minute but he was born in kumasi kana schooled in manchester and tiruvananthapuram then went on to pune for doing his medicine and after post graduation he went back to uk and continued his training there and then specialized in hepatobiliary surgery and that was from royal free and royal hospital in london and he continued to be in the forefront of not only providing healthcare in the hepatobiliary surgery but also probably more than that in having a much different outlook to health and the welfare and the outlook about health that people should have and that is what attracted us and that is what i requested him to come and tell us about uh, he is the clinical leader quality improvement and patient safety he was in the health foundation improvement fellow at the institute of health care improvement at harvard in 2011 to 12 and he did the ma in medical ethics and law from keele university in the uk and he took sabbatical and went down to singapore to improve the trauma care and set up the department there in singapore 1819 he is the principal of staff college for leadership in healthcare and is a trustee of the charity he is married to natali and has three children kasper even though the spelling of the second child is anjali i would think it is in malayalam we will call it anjali anjali it is spelled as anjali and of course then bodhi and he has a long standing hatha vinyasa yoga say an ardent yoga as well as vipassana meditation follower so you can see how diverse an outlook and perspective ajit holds and i am not surprised that even though he is by profession dealing with hepatobiliary work he is more than that and it was very obvious when i listened to him in the kerala health webinar and that is why i thought he will be the right person to come and tell us about some other aspects of our specialty not just obstetrics obstetrics is the one where that touches the heart and soul of the not only the people to the patients but the whole family and the society and we are so concerned about social obstetrics that i thought we will invite ajit to come and lecture to us in the name of this oration in the name of professor mk k menon so thank you very much ajit for accepting our invitation and agreeing to talk to us on this topic which i am sure is very close to your heart thank you thank you pilot sir without wasting even a single minute may we now listen to dr achit abraham on his talk just be be just reflections on mindfulness and compassionate leadership in healthcare over to you sir um good evening everybody can you see my screen now thank you um and you can hear me okay yes sir thanks 
So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and friends, and um, my er esteemed colleague, Dr. Nirja Bhatla, if she's on the call, um, good evening. Um, and let me start by saying greetings from London and a very big thank you to Dr. Piley for that very generous and I think somewhat flattering introduction. But nonetheless, I appreciate that. Um, so as he said, I'm very much a son of Kerala and the Malayali. And so it's a matter of some pride for me to be given the privilege of speaking uh, in memory of such a great and distinguished um, um, son of Kerala in, in terms of Professor M.K. K. Menon's legacy. And I hope that I can do a little bit of justice to his ethos of compassion and service today in what I have to say. Um, so, um, there's a couple of things I wanted to say before that, as uh, Dr. Piley has kindly alluded, my background is a bit complex. I have grown up and trained and worked on many different continents. Um, I'm a Syrian Christian Protestant from the Church of South India by family background. All of my education, pretty much all of my education was from Jesuits, including Loyola High School in uh, Trivandrum, as we used to call it then. Um, and um, I've also practiced yoga and done uh, Vipassana meditation for over 30 years now. So as people might say, um, I mean, the other thing to say is that I'm obviously a surgeon, so that I bring a certain surgical pragmatism to everything that I do. And you may have noticed that my Christian name is Thomas. And so I bring a certain scientific skepticism to my inquiries as well. So what you have effectively is, is an avial not of my way making, but I hope like our Kerala avial, this will be something that is palatable and tasty. So the second thing to say is that I don't approach this talk with any sense of being an expert in any way. Um, as my wife often tells me to remind people, she says that any progress that I've made over the years has been very slow. So I have to acknowledge that before I start. So whatever I offer today is offered in the spirit of humility, but it's offered honestly as things that I think I have glimpsed some truths in, and I hope that will offer some shared food for thought and some provocation um, today in, in, in terms of uh, the way we move forwards. So I thought today that I would talk about mindfulness, but in the context of compassion and in the context of social justice that Dr. Piley has alluded to, um, it, particularly in the context of healthcare and in the context of our responsibility as healthcare leaders to, I think, increasingly shape the systems that inform the health of our population as much as they do the healthcare that we provide. So um, the... I wanted to talk about this in the context of COVID. As I said at that um, conference that Dr. Piley alluded to, the Strategic Development Goal Kerala Conference, I mean, the response of Kerala to the first wave of COVID was something that the entire world looked on with great respect and awe and was a source of great pride. And to be honest, the response in the UK was not up to that. But in the second surge that we have had, we learned from our mistakes. And I'm very proud that both my organization and the NHS as a whole responded in very effective ways. For example, in my hospital with an ITU bed base of 45, we went within two months to 166 beds. Um, so that was the kind of scale up in terms of resource and response that we were able to manage. So we have done well since, and now with the vaccination program, we are hitting above 60% of the population already vaccinated. So hopefully we are catching up with some of the good work that was um, done in Kerala and that we have learned from. But COVID taught us three things, like every tragedy, like every cloud, there is a silver lining, I believe. And Today, I wanted to reflect on three things that it has taught us. Um, one is the idea of personal resilience and self-care. So the first thing I will talk about is resilience. And I want to speak in that context to mindfulness as one tool and how just being can allow us to become more resilient. Leading on from that, I want to talk about the second lesson certainly that we have learned in the UK 
is about the importance of the health, the psychological health and the physical health of all of our staff, you know, of our teams and the organization as a whole. And um, so that's the general well-being piece that I hope I want to talk to and how much kindness and compassion ought to inform all of that. And again, how mindfulness can help with that. And the third thing that COVID has made very evident in the UK, I don't know. I mean, I think Kerala in many ways has been blessed. It's a different state, um, I, I think, from many other Indian states. And we've had a longstanding tradition and commitment to egalitarianism. And therefore, um, some of the indices like maternal mortality and infant mortality are as good as anywhere in the world alongside population health and literacy. So this resonates for me, particularly in terms of my pride in some of the principles of the NHS. Nonetheless, in the UK, we have seen how the impact of COVID has resulted in disparate outcomes, in inequity of outcomes. And so I wanted to reflect a little bit today on how, what, what, that Im, what implications that has for healthcare providers like us. And my view would be that we can no longer say that our job is only to provide healthcare. And so those are the three themes that I hope I can touch upon, if only briefly today. Um, so the first thing to say is about mindfulness, um, you know, and resilience. I think this quote from Samuel Beckett, one can debate what context he offered it in, but nonetheless, the sense of resilience about being something that allows us to deal with adversity, face up to challenge, get up again, and then keep going is something that we've certainly needed in the context of the COVID crisis. And um, I am a trained uh, resilience and mindfulness trainer. So I help a lot of our junior surgeons and consultants with some of their resilience and mindfulness uh, support, not just me on my own, but there is a team of people. And we try and encourage people to focus on their own well being and resilience. And there are some things that some of you will look at and smile because these are. A, our long-standing Ayurvedic principles. I mean, the notion of appropriate sleep, uh, the right kind of exercise, diet, um, rest and recovery, all of these are integral principles to our ancient wisdom, ways of wisdom and uh, ancient Ayurvedic principles. But there is also mindfulness offer within it. And I, I just highlighted also the need for friends and family and teams and organizational support in the makeup of people. And all of this applies not just to surgeons like myself, but to obstetricians, gynecologists. And I think the more I talk and mentor and coach colleagues, I find that not everybody has the time necessarily or always takes care of themselves in a way that allows them to be more robust and resilient. So I want to spend a little bit of time today talking about how we might um, help with that sort of thing. So again, that was something I think there's a bit of um, appropriation that goes on there. But if we come back to the uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and the eight principles, um, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, one is that sometimes people think that yoga is about some sort of physical contortion or gymnastics or demonstrating that you can put your body in very interesting poses. And that is very far from the teachings of the Yoga Sutras. So Stira Sukham Asanam is basically attempting to create a physical ease and stability, which prepares you then to... Um, for the stillness that is required for meditation. So hence the second shloka itself is yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, which means stilling of the changing of the states of your mind is the purpose of yoga, that union with something greater than yourself, whatever we want to call it, whether we call it the universe or consciousness or God. Um, and so it is not just about the physical, it is about the mental, it is about the mindfulness this is discipline. And this is why I think the practice of yoga has a lot to offer for many of us uh, in terms of that physical and mental well being piece. The other thing I want to emphasize is that people often try to practice these things outside of the system in isolation. And I think there is again a pointer in Indian wisdom to the fact that all of this has to be put on the foundation of yama and niyama. So without an ethical foundation, 
the attempt to pr practice meditation from an app or to just do some physical poses and exercises in isolation uh, fails to reveal an integrated approach to all of this and is less likely to afford the benefits that we would hope for. Um, so that's something about yoga. And the second thing is um, that I'm very passionate about is mindfulness. And there are many sort of myths and misnomers about mind mindfulness. This is a jargon word now. Um, it's almost something that people commodify and, um, and you, you know, it's almost like a fast food offer now. You have apps, you do mindfulness for five minutes, and there's nothing wrong with all of that. I think all of that's good and can yield some benefit. But nonetheless, it's, it's important that we recognize that it is not just some relaxation technique or a form of escapism or a way of getting instant grat gratification. Uh, it's not about just making your mind blank or controlling your thoughts or trying to generate ecstatic states or anything like that, or even attempting to achieve instant enlightenment. I, I, I think, I mean, there, there may be some people who do, but I certainly <laughs> have been trying for 30 years with very little success. Um, so there is a lot that I think meditation and mindfulness is not about. Um, but it is certainly something that is simple to understand in terms of the practices, but very hard work in terms of actually doing but it can be a very useful tool for our self-awareness and self-management. And I'll come on to how this is relevant to leadership a little bit later on. As I said before, it's helped by an ethical foundation. And there is a lot of good evidence now that this can help physiologically, but also psychologically in terms of evidence base to show that it can reduce anxiety, stress and depression. Um, and therefore, it is something that we should all consider could potentially be in our toolkit in terms of um, something that maintains our personal resilience and our well-being. So there are many definitions. I like this one by Jonathan Kabat-Zinn. Uh, he is a famous teacher of mindfulness and a physician himself and introduced the mindfulness-based stress reduction program in Massachusetts in the 1970s. If you're not familiar with his work, I think uh, all of us as physicians ought to explore what he has to say about these things. Um, and he, call, he says mindfulness is nothing more than paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So those are the four key attributes. It's about paying attention with purpose in the now, in the present moment, and without judgment. And that's a useful thing to keep in mind when we think about what people mean by mindfulness. Now, there is a lot of um, interesting Buddhist psychology that informs the psychology of mindfulness, and that goes back more than 2000 years. I have put a small reference there for those who are interested in some of the detail. This is an excellent book on Buddhist psychology that leads to it, but I've just tried to simplify it here. and. The model, the mental model uh, is that, you know, we, we, we all see the world in a particular way. There is a particular stimulus that comes to us and we naturally react often without being present in the moment. We react through to the world and that becomes a habitual reaction. And that over time builds the mental constructs and the behavioral patterns that constitute our habits. And that then starts to condition the way we approach the world. It informs our biases, and then that colors the way we see the world. So you can see how this cycle can start to develop. So the, the benefit of mindfulness is that it puts a little bit of space, I think, between the stimulus that we receive from the world and our response rather than reaction, hence the bit about non-judgmental. So we can, by inserting some space between a stimulus and how we respond non-judgmentally with gentleness, with curiosity and with compassion for ourselves, insert a distance between stimulus and response, which allows us to change our habits and to approach the world afresh. And as a consequence, one can find within that space 
um, over time and with disciplined practice, uh, a growing sense of compassion and joy and freedom and equanimity. Um, so that is the piece around our personal resilience that can inform our outlook towards others and this reaching out in kindness in our practice towards our patients, towards their families and our communities. So um, as I, uh, as Dr. P P uh, Piley kindly pointed out, uh, I, I'm uh, privileged to be the principal of the NHS Staff College for Leadership in Healthcare, which is a charity that uh, tries to develop leaders in, in, in the NHS. Um, and I won't try to summarize um, too much of this, but what we emphasize is what Ron Heifetz describes as adaptive skills. So we make a distinction between technical and adaptive skills. What I mean by that is I could be a very good uh, hepatobiliary surgeon in terms of the surgical technical expertise, and I, well, I hope that I am, but it doesn't necessarily follow that I have all of the adaptive skills that are necessary to, to lead effectively, to run a team effectively, to engage effectively beyond my area of uh, local expertise and to provide system leadership. And that requires adaptive skills and what Daniel Goldman de describes as emotional intelligence. So often what you see on the top are the person's skills and um, what, is, what you don't see is what is underneath. And those are the things that determine long-term sustainable effectiveness and success. And we try to teach and develop that in people in terms of their leadership skill set. And that includes a sense of self-awareness and self-regulation as well as an ability then to empathize and to reach out and lead in an effective and inspirational and service-driven way. Now that's okay in theory, but we need tools and some of that can come through training and simulation and feedback. But I link it back to mindfulness in that I think one of the other benefits of mindfulness is that we, and this is a very simple schematic that I have drawn myself. So forgive me for its, its very basic nature, but it is human to see oneself as the I in a quite concrete, way and to see the rest of the world and others as being outside of the eye. And what you will find in all of our great spiritual teachings um, is that as one develops the practice, there is an experiential, a lived experience of a softening of the boundary between the eye and the others. So it becomes more of I and we or us and the boundaries be between the sense of I and others becomes more porous. And we have a sense of our interdependence. And I think that is critical to understanding and developing a sense of deeper compassion, not just for others, but also for ourselves through this practice. So um, I think uh, steady and disciplined mindfulness practice can also help us to, to, to make the shift that I'm trying to describe with this schematic. So this is alluded to, and, and often this is not just about practice, this is about an opening of the heart and the mind to grace, if you like. And um, uh, this is what I think the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is saying in this quote that I love, that in a real sense, all of our lives are interrelated. All men and indeed women are caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. And we are tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one of us directly affects all indirectly. And that is not just something we can appreciate intellectually, but something that has to permeate our hearts as well. Um, and that then leads to a kind of leadership that is best described as compassionate leadership. Again, the King's Fund, Professor Michael West, who's a senior fellow at the King's Fund, these papers are easily available from the King's Fund. I think it's worth reading his paper on compassionate leadership. And he describes four simple steps 
to compassionate leadership. And this is again, the first step is where I think the practice of mindfulness can help us in terms of being able to attend, first of all, to be present, to be aware and to listen with fascination to the others. Listen with fascination or attend. It's only if we listen with fascination that we will understand what someone else is trying to say to us. And it's only if we understand that we will be able to empathize. And it is only when we empathize that we can intelligently act to help. So I think this model resonates a lot for me because I mean, my natural tendency is not to listen, but to tell other people what I'm thinking first. That is not terribly effective or compassionate. And certainly learning to listen with fascination is something that is worth doing if one is to understand, empathize, and then to help. So what does that mean? And how does that connect to being just? So I spoke about how COVID has made visible the inequities and disparities in society, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same all over the world. And so I think we not only have a responsibility to just be and to be kind, but I think increasingly as healthcare professionals, we have a responsibility to take a, a broader system view about the inequities in the provision of healthcare and in the health and well being of the populations we serve. So there is a call for all of us, I think, to be just. As Martin Luther King said, of all forms of inequity, Injustice in health and healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhuman. And he said this in 1966. Sadly, this is still true in many parts of the world, indeed in many parts of the UK and many parts of India too. So I'm very privileged to work for the NHS. I think the NHS for all of its flaws is a wonderful thing founded on wonderful ethical principles of providing healthcare universally to all free at the point of delivery still. And um, it is a great privilege to work in a system where somebody can walk off the street and get a liver transplant if they have a clinical need for it without paying one pound. But um, if you look at the work, so I work at the Royal London, it just has a long history and the whole Bart St. Bartholomew's history goes back, which you can see on the top right-hand corner, goes back to the 12th, 13th century the oldest medical school in the world and so on. And uh, we have very many famous names associated with our history. So it's a great privilege to work there. You can see in the middle picture at the top, this is the new um, three, three, three tower Royal London building, the blue building in the middle. On the left is the old Royal London Hospital. And on top, you can see we are one of the, we were the first major trauma center in the UK and you can see the helipad on top. So it's a great privilege for me to work there as a clinician and to be part of the NHS. But where we work brings home to life everything I'm saying about inequity. So you may, or may be familiar, I think, with the work of Sir Michael Marmot, who is the person who has done the most to bring to the fore the understanding of how the social determinants of health impact on the healthcare outcomes for patients. And this is the Marmot Review 10 years on the health equity paper, again, available free from the Institute of Health Equity. And for those of you who are interested in these questions, which I think all of you will be given your, um, um, given your um, maternal and infant um, uh, expertise, um, this would be a good and useful read. So what I've shown at the top is a, I mean, on the right, you can see that we, <laughs> I mean, Whitechapel, where I work, the Royal London looks a bit like parts of um, Mumbai or um, Delhi at times. Um, it's uh, very diverse and um, socioeconomically and ethnically diverse part of London, for those of you who have visited. It's a very poor part of London. And you can see at the top there, the, this is a heat map which shows the greatest areas of um, socioeconomic deprivation. And you can see that the reddest spot the arrow where I'm pointing to is where the Royal London and the Bart's health footprint sits within that red spot. And just to give you an idea of this is now an old analysis by the London Health 
uh, observatory from the Office of National Statistics. But if you move on the tube, for those of you who have visited London before, you will know that as you move east, each step on the tube, or each stop rather, that on the tube that you go eastwards represents almost one year's loss in life expectancy still. And these figures, although reasonably old, are not that far off from the current situation. So that's what we mean by inequity in terms of the health of the population. And so what I'm very proud to say, this is a very detailed slide. I don't want to belabor you with the detail too much, but I just want to show you the scale of the ambition. So I'm very privileged to chair uh, alongside my group chief executive, Dame Alwyn Williams, the Bart's Health Group Inclusion Board, which is now seeking to address these issues of racism and gender inequality and ageism and uh, uh, disability and so on um, through the Inclusion Board. Because we are the largest employer and the largest organization in the East of London, we can exercise an influence over the local economy and over um, employment and also over the health and well-being of the population working alongside public health and um, to, to create an anchor organization. So there are three big pillars to the work that we are doing. One is within the organization around equality, diversity and inclusion for our staff. And I won't go into the details, but that's what the inclusion center work is. And then there is an inclusion observatory that will be providing relevant data to measure our outcomes and hold ourselves to account and also celebrate our progress and success. And then there is a huge piece around community partnership, engagement, connectivity, which is about addressing the wider inequalities in health and access from those populations that are deprived in our borough. And we underpin this with a quality improvement approach and a leadership training approach called We Improve and We Lead. So that is some of the work that I have the privilege of uh, leading on within the organization in addition to my clinical duties. And I hope it will take us some way towards becoming a more just healthcare provider. So finally, I think I will end there. You know, this is one of my favorite quotes and you will all be familiar with this. I think we have got to a point now and COVID has made it clear that we now have to not only be healthcare providers, but also be the champions of justice in terms of health and equity in healthcare. So we have to be the change. So I thank you very much once more and I hope that we can go forth and be kind and be just. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you so much, sir. This is now a wonderful issue. And really, we compelled us, all of us, to have an introspection into our own clinical practices. I'm sure, sir, all those delegates who are listening to you today will be a bit, a fraction better tomorrow in the human aspect. Thank you so much for reminding us the value of humanity in our profession. Uh, thank you very much, Ajit, sir. Uh, Ajit, sir, I have done my uh, MBBS and MD from the BJ Medical College in Pune, and you are my much accomplished senior. It is with great pride I listen to you today, and you have given us lessons in life and points to ponder as a healthcare provider. It is with great pride that I read out the AKCOG 2021 Professor M.K. Krishnamenon Memorial Oration Citation. This is to certify that Mr. Ajit Abraham, senior consultant, minimally invasive and robotic, general trauma and hepatico pancreatio biliary surgeon, London, UK, has been conferred Professor M. K. Krishna Menon oration for the year 2021 on the topic Just Be, Be Just Reflections on Mindfulness and Compassionate Leadership in Healthcare, which he delivered at the conference. The oration is bestowed upon him in recognition of his outstanding contributions, not only as an astute multi specialty surgeon and a postgraduate teacher but also spearheading the very cause of ethical development on the medical front 
with mindfulness and leadership with a humane perspective. He stands testimony to the cause that any development devoid of people-centric approach would fall short of the desired results which it is bound to bring about. By awarding this oration, the society believes that Mr. Abraham would further his educative drive by churning out multi-generational surgeons equipped to face the challenges of the current and coming time. More importantly, that with a humane approach in pursuit of leading the drive to offer better patient care and every possible step of the patient, doctor interactions and relationship. We wish him decades of good health and academics for the betterment of humanity. Dated this, the 10th day of April 2021, signed by Dr. K. Ambujam, the President of the Kerala Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Dr. M. Venagopal, the Secretary of the Kerala Federation, read out with a chest filling with pride by Dr. Venagopal, as a, you know, regards for my seniors. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much once again. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful and profoundly honored. And it's wonderful that it's somebody from BJ Medical who has um, read that out to me. So I do appreciate it. I thank you all once again for your uh, time and your attention. And please stay well and stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We thank the reader as well as the chairperson for this wonderful session. I hope Dr. Veno, uh, this citation will reach sir by mail at least, isn't it? Yeah, I will take care of that. You know, he's my senior, I told you. And the medallion next time when you meet him, sir. <laughs> Hopefully next year. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us. Now, now we are moving on to Dr. Tanka Memorial Oration. And here we have three esteemed faculty as chairpersons. The first one, none other than Professor P.K. Shekharan former professor and head, Department of OG Medical College, Calicut, Vice President Foxy in 2010, President K. Falk in, during the tenure 2003 to 2004, Secretary and Treasurer of International Society for Study of Gestational Trophoblastic Disease, the Chair, World Congress of Gestational Trophoblastic Disease, Visiting Professor, Peking University, Beijing, and above all, the pillar of AKCOG, we should say. Right from the first AKCOG till this stage, I think he was the one who was holding the show directly or indirectly, being there as a leader, as a guide, as a teacher, and above all, a friend to all the generation. We welcome Shekharin sir to chair this session. Here comes our next teacher and the great personality, Dr. V. Raj Shekharin Nair, head of the department ONG at present SU2 Hospital, Patam. He was the former professor uh, of um, ONG at Calicut, Trivandrum, former dean, Kerala University of Health Science, past president of Kerala Federation of ONG. He was in government sector from 1972 to 2003 and in private sector, continuing his teaching and academics from 2003 onwards. The main areas of interest, maternal mortality reduction, contraception, quality assurance, and medical education, a great teacher, and a great artist as well. We welcome you, sir, to chair this session. Welcoming Dr. Ajitas, the current president of, incoming president of Kerala Federation of ONG, additional professor and head of the department from uh, GMC Kanno, KFOC president for the current year, past vice president, joint secretary of KFOC, past chairperson of research committee of KFOC, coordinator of maternal near miss review of KFOC, and past president of Kanunur ONG Society. And above all, he is the person who was carrying his work in a great way during the corona year. He was the person who has got the experience of conducting maximum number of COVID positive pregnancy. And he was our guide and mentor during the most difficult year in all our clinical doubts. Dear Ajit sir, we welcome you to chair this session. May I now invite Dr. P.K. Shekharan to talk about his beloved teacher, Dr. Tankam. Uh, this uh, prestigious oration is in the long memory of uh, Professor M. Tankam, former professor and head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the founder president of Caligat Society. Professor M. Tankam had an early education at Palghat and was a student of Queen Mary's College, Madras for her intermediate course. She had an MBBS and MD from Madras Medical College under the guidance of Sir A.L. Mudiliar, 
and professor m k krishnamen while serving as an assistant professor in the ong department at madras medical college she joined the kerala medical education department when the kerala state was reorganized she was posted as professor and head of the department of surgery and gynecology at calicut medical college in 1959 She was the superintendent of the Beach Hospital, the women and children wing of the Calicut Medical College for 15 years, and was a very good administrator. In fact, it was the first postgraduate course was started in obstetrics and gynecology at Calicut Medical College. She started the DGU and MD in ONG, and was the director and professor till her retirement in 1975, and close to the post of principal. Professor Tankam started the Calicut Society affiliated to the Foxy in the year 1964 and was the founder president and organized many conferences including the first Old Kerala conference at Calicut in 1979. Madam was an astute clinician and an excellent surgeon. I had the opportunity to start my training as the junior most staff in the department and i could see madam doing the very difficult surgeries of uh, very late uh, ovarian malignancies birth time cystectomies i could have the chance to watch her from a distance and uh, learn certain things even at that very junior age professor m tangam memorial oration is organized by the kerala federation during the all kerala conference every year through an endowment created by the generous contribution by professor m kanagam and professor s badran through the calicut society this year the oration will be delivered by professor neerja batla from aims new delhi we are thankful to madam for accepting our invitation and delivering the oration thank you thank you sir may I now invite rajeshkar sir to introduce our S- a faculty of the day dr neerja batla over to you sir my dear friends it is my pleasant duty to introduce to you dr neerja batla an internationally renowned gynecologist with special interest in cervical cancer currently she is the shobha s vegar distinguished professor of gynecology and professor of department of gynecology in aims new delhi and she is also the secretary general international federation of cervical pathology and colposcopy council member asian society of gynecology member who dgs advisory group on cervix and elimination and she is immediate past president of both foxy and figo oncology committees past president of association of gynec oncologists past president of aogin past secretary narchi national corresponding editor jogi so many laurels and she has she is the principal editor of the um, internationally renowned edition of jeff course principles of gynecology and she has authored more than 250 articles presented a large number more than 700 lectures and i think she is the most appropriate person to deliver an oration on cervical cancer elimination of t- turning a promise into reality madam on behalf of the kerala federation of obstetrics and gynecology i have great pleasure in inviting you to deliver the thangam memorial oration over to you madam thank you for your very kind uh, introduction uh, dr nair and greetings to all the luminaries of kerala federation i am so honored and humble really to be here and i thank the uh, chair uh, the present office bearers as well as the outgoing office bearers for a moving ceremony i attended i thank dr shekhar and dr pailey for inviting me to do this oration and i have been meaning to come to kerala for i think last two years and i have been looking forward in fact to being in kerala because it is god's own country and a visit is always always special but it was not meant to be and it was to be here but it was very moving for me to hear about professor thankam herself a luminary beyond compare and what a peaceful and a what a uh, visage she has 
and hearing sir about mudelliar menon i tell you it took me back to my days of residency myself when we used to read their books and they were like the demi gods that we heard about so uh, really today is a very special day for me and i really thank you for this invitation to be here today and i hope that the uh, oration i will deliver would have met with the approval of professor thankam who was so committed to the cause of the women and their good health my topic today cervical cancer elimination turning a promise into reality what is the promise really what does a woman actually want all she is asking here is freedom from cervical cancer she needs to have the awareness she needs to have the screening the girls need to have their vaccine and we can be blessed with healthy moms healthy daughters and all the joys of life is it really so simple is it something that is doable or not sound simple but then what is the problem the problem is that we have all the ingredients we have the tools also and we have loads of guidelines as well and still it is not turning into that tasty dish what we need and why is that happening with us we know just to translate it into the cervical cancer situation we know that pap smear is a tool that works we have known this not today more than 50 years have passed we know that if we do regular paps we will have a decrease in the cancers we will have a decrease in the in situ uh, in the mortality and we will have an increase in the in situ lesions we have also understood that if we cannot do pap we can do vi willy at least the sensitivity is the same we have been told by ir in 2005 that this handbook has declared that primary screening hpv can reduce cervical cancer incidence and mortality and today we have newer devices galore we have our own indian guidelines which i think many of you are now following the foxy gcpr which is there and yet we have a program which is mostly only on paper and if i just roll back to the past and what dr usha saraiya was always saying preventable but not yet prevented and this reminds me when i was a very junior faculty and i went to my director asking for something she said you are asking for the three ms which are the most difficult to provide men money and materials and this is the situation that we lamented preventable but not yet prevented and then we had two giants in the field of low resource methods in cervical cancer screening who really proved the way forward and one of course dr shankar narayanan who you all know very well who has done yeoman work started out from regional cancer center in tiruvananthapuram went on to iarc and did no enormous studies in africa asia and worked with all the possible uh, societies to prove what we could do in the lower middle income countries and the other one who i also regard as my guru being professor linet denny who also contributed immense knowledge regarding low middle uh, income countries and they were the ones who showed in their large studies how a simple application of 5% tetracycline acid or lugol's iodine was comparable to pap smear suitable for all levels of healthcare instant results facilitated the single visit approach and minimized the loss to follow up magnification devices did come but did not improve the test performance but yes they did provide a good light source of course there were a lot of concerns with this method quality assurance increased inflammatory reactions which would increase the number of false positives and not suitable for postmenopausal women once the transformation zone recedes into the canal insufficient data on women with hiv not as much a problem in india as for africa 
But Dr. Shankar's group did a lot of work. This was the atlas which came out again from Kerala with Dr. Ramani Wesley, which is a practical manual. It is still the gold standard and there are free downloads from the IARC website to standardize the, uh, the description of whether they are or they are not VIA positive. And yet, and yet, even the countries who have adopted in a systematic way still continue to have some decline, but not good enough. And these Globocan data, which comes out from WHO IARC every few years continues to show that there is a persisting inequity Asia, Africa, Latin America continue to be the deepest colors, both for incidence and for mortality. And now this last Global Can 2020 has been worrying because there has actually been an increase in the total numbers. This fourth year human development index shows clearly that the contribution is mainly coming from the countries with the low HDI. But I want to just take you back to Globocan 2018. And here you will see, this is showing you for both the sexes that the lung cancer is the commonest ca cancer, which is followed closely by breast cancer. And you do have this, the uh, cervical cancer here jutting out. And similarly, you can see for the deaths, you have here the breast cancer, it is coming at the fifth position and the cervical cancer is there. And you see what has happened in 2020. Breast cancer is now the number one cancer among both the sexes. And it is not even just as neck to neck as before. And in women, it is taking up a quarter of the pie. It is the number one cause of both incidence and mortality. And in this global data, cervix comes at fourth position in both. If we look country-wise, we have overtaken China to now be the country contributing the highest number of cervical cancer cases back to 123,000. That is one fourth. And in terms of deaths also, we have now gone back up 77,000. So if you look now at the Indian women's case, you can see that control of breast and cervical cancer would reduce the cancer burden in women by half. And oral cavity is another 5%, which is an equally uh, detectable one. And what is sad is not just the size of the blue charts which show the incidence, because these should not be so big for preventable cancers, but also the size of the red, which should be a negligible fraction, because if they come early, they would not die. So all screening programs that we conduct must, must, must combine the both, breast and cervical cancer, Today, it is not good enough to say we had a PAP camp or we had a VI camp or we had an NE camp, which did not look at breast. Because if the woman displayed a good health seeking behavior and came to us, we cannot spare her the cervical cancer and have her presenting with an advanced breast cancer. The WHO life course approach to cervical cancer control has been around long enough, not only primary, but even the primordial prevention of awareness dissemination, the secondary for the screening and treatment and the tertiary and adding on even the palliative care emphasis has been there. But in 2018, the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, first gave the call to action to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health problem by 2030. And so many agencies joined in this effort, which was really the first description of political will. I understand from a story that Richard Horton, the editor of Lancet, was the one who suggested this to him. And he made a call to Ian Fraser who had developed the vaccine and said that, uh, and talked about it. And then Dr. Nono, who is the additional director general says he called her and said, do you think it's a crazy idea? 
And she said, no, I don't think, I think it is doable. And that was the story behind this announcement. And we in FIGO at the time, Dr. Purandre was the president, I was chairing the oncology committee and we had a side event at that, uh, alongside that health assembly. And uh, we discussed how FIGO could contribute to this endeavor. And you see here, Dr. Carlos, who is the current uh, president uh, of FIGO. At that time, Dr. Purandre made the statement, too often women who are now being saved by the reduction in maternal mortality are dying instead from cervical cancer, a preventable disease. Already by all the political will and the money that had been put into it, maternal mortality numbers had become less than the numbers dying of cervical cancer. Today, the numbers from cervical cancer have increased further, increasing this disparity even more. But in the middle of all the COVID problem and almost at the height actually for us in Delhi, November was the height. We had this declaration at the end of the uh, World Health Assembly meeting where they had a formal launch of the global strategy to uh, eliminate cervical cancer, a cervical cancer free future. And there was a lot of excitement around the globe. A lot of you I, I know have participated. People lit up their hospitals in teal, which was the color. So Cancer Foundation had the Howrah Bridge lit up as did many monuments around the world. And we had symposiums, screening programs, a lot of media coverage and a lot of excitement. What is this global strategy, which 193 countries, including India are signatories to? It is that there are less than four cases of cervical cancer per 100,000 women years. And that makes it a rare cancer. The rare cancer means less than four cases. So the it is uh, envisaged that if by 2030, you can have a system which gets 90% of girls vaccinated by 15 years of age, 70% of women screened with an effective test, which at this time means an HPV test at 35 and 45 years of age. And 90% of women are identified with cervical disease uh, who are identified, receive the treatment for their pre-cancer or cancer. Then we would be well on the road to elimination and to achieving this SDG target of 30% reduction in mortality from cervical cancer. And the HPV tests which are available are generally very easy to collect from the cervix, similar to a pap. Some of them actually use the LBC medium itself. This is the hybrid capture brush. They usually detect a cocktail of 13 to 14 high-risk types without specifying which one. And some of them do identify 16 and 18 separately. So they are, the high-risk genotypes become uh, identified upfront. When HPV tests first came, they were used for the triage of ASCUS PAP results and for the follow-up of treated CIN. But today they are recommended for primary screening uh, in women more than 30 years of age. F they first started actually as an adjunct and today in many countries they are being used alone. But here I want to make one point that it is very important to use the standardized and validated tests because homegrown PCRs have been seen to bo work both ways. They can either be so sensitive that they pick up an infection that is not clinically relevant or they use the homegrown primers and they are not sensitive and they miss the lesion. So it is very important, especially if using it alone to use the standardized and validated tests. People have asked us why we continue to talk about co-testing in the FOXI GCPR. And this is my answer that even HPV, you need to be sure from your lab, what kind of results you are getting. So it's a good idea to go with the co-testing first before you decide that you are happy with those HPV results. And these were the sort of results that showed the superiority of HPV test. Now, natural, it is actually a little natural when you realize that HPV is the necessary cause of cervical cancer. It is clear that it needs to be seen, but the question is how sensitive the test. 
And this meta-analysis was not of studies from the de developing world, but from Europe and North America, which showed that the sensitivity of PAP was little better than the toss of a coin, whereas the sensitivity of HPV was way higher in women who were aged more than 30 years. But when they broke it down by CIN3, which is considered by some to be the true precursor lesion and CIN2, for every age group, they found that cytology had almost half the sensitivity what was seen in the HPV group. And this is the reason why HPV became so popular. And just as an example, I know it's looking a little complicated, but just to show you how cytology is um, helped by the HPV testing, this shows the increasing risk of precancer. And this shows you if it's cytology negative, anything under 2% is generally considered fine. If it is ASCUS or LCIL, it starts moving up. And this is the reason why we recommend that these people should be looked at by other triage tools. But if you have an HPV positive cytonegative, you can see that the risk becomes more than it was for a, a simple cytonegative. Also, if there's an HPV negative ASCUS, their risk is far lower. And an HPV negative cytonegative is almost nothing. An HPV positive on the uh, ASCUS, on the other hand, has as much risk as an LCIL. So you see that HPV has a far better um, discerning capability as to which is the lesion that we should worry about. And similarly, post-treatment, uh, it has been seen to be the better test to follow up the patient at risk of recurrence. Then again, there were other studies which showed that these women who were negative at the baseline for cytology in blue, HPV in red, and co-testing in green, as the years went by, the cytology negative showed up a fair number of cases, whereas it was much less with the HPV negative, which were only marginally more in the co-testing. And this became the basis for recommending the increased interval for screening with the HPV test or with the co-testing as compared to PAP, which could be screened annually initially in the American system. And then they also moved to three yearly because the numbers were not as high as there are also harms of screening to be considered. Whenever we do screening, we must be sure that we need to do it because aside of psychological harms from thinking about it, there can be actual harms because you did a procedure like a cone or a leap, which may impact the future fertility. So it is not considered right to overscreen and the American system also moved from the annual to the three yearly. And here you see why the genotyping becomes so important because in women, and we usually talk about HPV over 30 because a lot of women younger than that will be positive anyway at the third decade when they're soon after the sexual initiation. But if you follow these women, you see that the HPV 16 and the HPV 18 have a far higher cumulative incidence of developing CIN3 and cancer as compared to those with any other high risk type, which are only marginally more than the ones who were HPV negative totally. And this is why, as I mentioned, there are some tests which will within themselves differentiate the HPV 16, 18, and there are some other um, triage protocols which will put this as the next step. Now, HPV testing being an expensive test, the question was whether we can apply this test to rural India. And Dr. Shankar did this landmark trial in Osmanabad, Barshi, where he studied a large number of women in four arms in which they either had VIA or cytology or HPV testing. And this was dividing the villages into clusters. The fourth cluster just received the standard of care, which at that time was awareness and uh, access to uh, a healthcare facility if they felt the need or symptoms. And they found that a single round of HPV testing 
was associated with a significant reduction in the number of advanced cervical cancers and deaths from cancers. And the difference widened as the years went by. For the number of cancers, the cytology was intermediate, but the deaths from cancers, it was almost overlapping the VIA. But yet it seemed that because of the cost, the VIA testing would remain the reality until some affordable point of care HPV tests emerged. The very interesting finding in this study was that the cancer incident rates among the screen negative women who were followed up were considerably lower amongst the HPV group as compared to the cytology and VIA group with large numbers of women comparable numbers in all the groups. So the search definitely is on for the point of care affordable tests. We have a couple. The care HPV test by Kyogen, which made the hybrid capture, is there, but it is not affordable enough and it is not point of care. It takes two and a half hours less time, no doubt, and it's very simple reagents which anybody can work, but it needs the batch to be collected. And uh, the gene expert, again, also, it is uh, uh, something which is available now widely because of tuberculosis. And in fact, the true NAT platform is also being explored for this purpose. Again, not uh, inexpensive. It's been hugely subsidized for TB, actually. But it can be done one patient at a time. You can have the answers in less than an hour. So it is more point of care to that extent. There's a lot of hope and anticipation that the COVID uh, uh, tests that have been developed will help us with platforms which we can use for developing some HPV diagnostics in due course. If we get something like this strip test to work, it's like a pregnancy strip test and it will be great. But all these tests are simple, affordable, accurate, and fairly rapid and easily set up even in field conditions because they just require simple uh, electrical requirements. But the one thing I want to say is about this uh, screening approach by the uh, gynecologists who sometimes allow the ideal to become the enemy of the good. You know, many times, many of us are called by the ministry or by uh, the government to give advice about a thing. And we have to understand the difference between when a patient comes to you one-on-one -on -one in your clinic versus dealing with the public at large in a public health setting. And this multi-visit approach, I have seen many gynecologists being very purist and saying, no, we have to have a biopsy report. How can we advise treatment? But think of the woman who gets up from her house, goes to screen, uh, get screened, uh, in her uh, neighborhood, then comes back, then she's told, no, you're positive, now you need to go for a colposcopy somewhere, maybe a biopsy and ablation will be done the same day, maybe it will not, maybe she'll be sent back home again and told, come back to take your report, and when she does so, she's told, no, 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 go back, we can't do much, you need to go to the next place for a leap and a conization, and she does that. And again, one time more, she comes back and then no, 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 it's cancer. Now I have to go. It's not surprising the women get lost and we have to be open to encouraging the single visit approach. And the point of care HPV testing has been shown in modeling to have significant benefits in whether in, in one visit screen and treat much better than in the two visit screen and treat. So linking with the treatment is critical critical. And this is something we already have in our FOXI GCPR, where we have distinguished between C and treat, which is also termed as colposcopy and treat, versus screen and treat. The colposcopy treat and treat when you're sitting in your clinic, when the patient has come with an abnormal cytology report, we know how high the specificity is, and a very great chance that it is going to have some underlying problem. And when the colposcopy scoring also indicates the same, you can go ahead and do a treatment, even a leap, ablation, anything, because the probability of overtreatment is so low. And we know that we do lose women, even in the tertiary setting, even the educated women who will come back and say, no, this happened, that happened, I didn't come back. So it's very important to treat them there and then. And this started from the colposcopy clinics abroad. But in public health programs, we usually have VI detecting the lesion and the treatment is usually only ablation if the criteria are fulfilled. 
and you can of course take the biopsy before you do the ablation and you can get a post hoc diagnosis to confirm it if it is a high prevalence area the probability of over treatment will be correspondingly lower now another advantage of hpv is the self sampling which can be taken by the woman herself from the vagina as high as she can go or it can be taken by a health worker for her and it will save her the bother of finding sterile equipment speculum and also light source and all of that so it is usually recommended for the hard to reach women but it can be even for women who for privacy reasons or other reasons do not want to come and get their screening done and the this has again been shown to have a an impact on the screening a four fold increase in screening uptake because of the reduction in the women's barriers we used this chart which was translated into hindi to explain to the women and we found that 98% of women could provide a satisfactory sa sample with a 94% concordance there are in general it has been found to have good concordance some reports to the contrary but still for women who cannot get anything else it remains the best choice and in these times of covid when women do not want to come to the uh, centers for uh, preventive services when we don't want to encourage footfalls uh, and we want to have distancing and we can't have the camps as before self sampling is an ideal option in such a situation so with all of this what has happened is that the previous currency of the pap smear has, has been replaced by the new currency of the hpv test in the minds of various people including who who said some years ago now that countries that have not already established cytology programs should not start to do so now and in fact when the foxy gcpr we have adapted the who guidelines to help people decide because all tests have their pros and cons all have trade offs and you have to see which is the best fit but something is better than nothing in every which way so if you are screening by cytology and it's going fine please continue if it's not and your patient can afford hpv then that's the best if not vi is fine and you will choose the triage facilities according to availability but definitely try to make it a single visit approach so now for us as a country vi seemed to be the way to go and this was guided by very large trials which showed the impact and in tamil nadu the breast and cervical cancer screening program led the way for the development of the national program which started in 2016 even before the who call uh, the prime minister had made a call and said within 3 months i want to see this program and lo and behold the operational guidelines were out and the following year this was out for guidance for a screen and treat approach and now we've had some follow up on this more guidelines have come and latest now this month only these uh, have been turned out the secondary level facility care but it is work in progress because we find that about 700 districts in the country maybe 200 have taken it up and the breast and cervical cancer uh, breast and oral screening because this is a combined one all the non communicable diseases and the three common cancers but the breast and oral maybe 7 and a half crore have been screened only 1 and a half crore for cervix and then the linkage is not there so it's a very difficult way to go and because screening alone as we know is not going to work we have to treat those lesions so we need to use the colposcopes the portable colposcopes thermal ablators which are now available for the health workers to capture and transmit the ai incorporation we tried this pocket tvc which is like an ultrasound probe we have uh, we are developing one at aims called serva where you can fit the thermal ablator right on the same thing so you have all these new digital imaging coming up and they give a very good picture in fact the pocket colposcope we found that you could go down very close to the cervix and capture as good as you want and you can use the sweet score differentially to set off the sensitivity at 5 you get 100% sensitivity so you get all but if you want to see when whom to treat you set it at 8 and you get a good uh, specificity and very and very chance of uh, uh, missing the lesion 
So there are also other developments in the treatment devices. The cryo has been a cryo pen, cryo pop is now in our market already, and the thermocoagulators. So these take away the problems of the cylinders, the way these have been devised. And these are the mobile uh, variants, which you can have the portable ones, which are battery pack charged and you can go on. And it's a very brief uh, one. It takes the temperature to 100 degrees. This is the one which is the uh, clinic variation. This is the one which is the portable variation. And you can set the timing 30 to 40 seconds. And you can, in this case, unlike the cryo, which no longer recommends overlapping, you can put the overlapping applications. So can we achieve the 70%, 90% uh, expectation? Yes, if we all get involved, we include the other health workers, we supervise the work at the last mile facility through our society, single visit approach, uh, and digital solutions, which of course are emerging with COVID. If every gynecologist of this country takes it up, why not? And for HPV vaccination, I will briefly summarize that we have two more vaccines. After the two, we started with Cervix Gardasil. We have the non-avalent, which has included several other types also to make it more comprehensive, has also changed the formulation a little bit and added more VLPs. And we have a Chinese vaccine, which is available in some places, mainly in China, I think. Again, it's bivalent with a different type of a formulation. In India, we were not expecting non-avalent till 2023 because of availability issues. But now because of COVID and some countries not starting off, I believe we will have it next month. And the Serum Institute has made the one where we are doing the multicentric phase three. Unfortunately, no emergency use authorization is coming. So we have to complete it, but recruitment is over. And this will indeed be the affordable one. Because although there are under 130 countries and territories which have, but you can see that some of these are very small, Gavi enabled. And most of these are actually countries which already have a, a very low cervical cancer burden. There are many which have recommended for boys also, but because of this vaccine shortage, WHO recommends that they should not be vaccinated till there is enough vaccine for girls. And you know about the various trials which show that it is safe and effective, and these are by demonstrating the reduction of incident and persistent infection. Persistent is now accepted actually as a surrogate for proving the vaccine efficacy. Still, there were people who said that just because you prevented CIN, how does it mean that you have prevented cancer? And we had all this anti-vax talk. But now we have the first evidence of reduction in invasive cervical cancer which has come from the Swedish registries, you know how good they are, 500,000 who got at least one dose and then twice the number who didn't get anything. Here there were only 19 who got a diagnosis of cancer versus 538 in this twice the number group. So if you look at it and they analyzed it, of course, they even baseline is very good. We were talking about four. They are at 5.27 with such good programs that they have. But in the vaccinated 0.73 and the adjusted only 0.37. And if they are before age 17, it was just 0.12. You can see here, this is how, and always these graphs will widen with the years as the differences become more obvious. So this is the unvaccinated. These are the ones vaccinated 17 to 30. And these are the ones vaccinated before age 17. So now one thing was there that the number of vaccine doses, we don't know how much they were screened, but probably well because of where they are. The other great development is the single dose, which we have been following these women uh, in our study for more than 10 years, which was stopped and we had these serendipitous ones. And we have observed that they have mounted some response which has continued. So maybe it is that not too much antibody is required because we find when we follow them after marriage that with three dose and single dose, there is not really much infection, a difference in the infection rate. And this data seen by stage led to this off-label recommendation in October 2019 that you can give one dose to the adolescent girls 
and three to five years later, you can give the second because there are trials which are powered for this question. Ours was observation because the randomization was lost. So three to five years later, if you can follow up and call these girls, you can do it like this and then say whether you do or don't need. And similar the information has come out of the systematic review for the single dose, which has looked at both bivalent and quadrivalent and supports the premise that one HPV vaccine dose may be as effective. The durationability of the single dose has been seen in the ones who received only one dose in, of bivalent in the Costa Rica trial. They find that more than a decade later, the single dose vaccine efficacy remained high, the antibodies remain stable, and uh, they've also looked at cross protection in the single dose women. They found that the three dose had the uh, cross protection, but they also found that in the one dose also, it was comparable. Of course, the confidence intervals were wide because there was a small sample size, but there are a lot of trials that are studies that are going on evaluating single dose. And most of them are expected to be concluded these light color stars in the next year or two. And that is when we will expect to know. Meanwhile, this modeling by Karen Canfeld shows that if you gave the girls only vaccination, this is the rate at which you will decrease by the end of the century. But if to this girls only vaccination, you add even just once in lifetime screening and cancer treatment, you advance everything by a good 40 years. And the girls only vaccination has an 89% reduction combined with a twice in lifetime screening, there is a 96% reduction and as you can see here, the years going by and the red colors are diminishing into the light blue and the dark blue. And by the end of the century, with these strategies, you can get control as is the desired level by WHO. So now International Women's Day in March 2020, 2021, the world was temporarily closed. I don't know how temporary it is. This is from one of the theaters in New York but not our Foxy team, not our Foxy team who have made the impossible into possible. And this Foxy's nation, nationwide screening program, which was the brainchild of Dr. Alpesh Gandhi with his super team in 2020, they covered the paramilitary forces all across the country. In 2021, despite COVID, we have covered so many, and I'm sure many of you have been involved in all of this. The data are still being uploaded as the follow-ups continue. Every Foxian has been sensitized. It is just super what has been done. And now what they have also done is to launch the Northeast Screening Program, implementing the strategy with, in partnership with the government, with WHO, et cetera. Why Northeast? Because there's a good connectivity, infrastructure, literacy, and the data from ICMR has shown the high cancer rates. The cervical cancer is high. Sikkim has had a great vaccination program. Others have also got good screening and good treatment facilities. So it can be a model for the whole country. But it is, does not mean that we cannot, each of us have our own models, whatever we would like to do. In the end, I would just like to say that Dr. Muhammad Fa Mahmoud Fatallah said this years ago when he was the president. He said, women are not dying because of diseases we cannot treat. They are dying because societies have yet to make the decision that their lives are worth saving. I think the time has come to turn the promise into reality for each of us to make cervical cancer prevention a daily habit. All girls should receive their first dose of HPV vaccine before the age of 15 years. Even today, even in this time of COVID pandemic, please look out for them and get them to have it. For those who are less affording, it's quite all right to advise just taking a single dose and they can confirm the need of the second dose in three years time. They can save up by then and take it. It's not such a big deal. And then you can offer HPV testing to everyone who can afford it at least at 35 and 45 years. And keep a portable colposcope and thermal ablator in your clinic. Step up prevention activities in the month of January, International Women's Day, 
and all these opportunities i like this song demands a treadmill approach nobody can be complacent that their levels are low it has shown a reversal in so many countries and it can very well do so now we have already seen the upswing happening in the latest global can so once again i thank you for this opportunity with, to be with you here today thank you very much for this honor and this opportunity thank you so much uh, professor nirja it is the mantra screen 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 and if possible give the vaccination and it was a wonderful oration dr deepthi back to you thank you madam that was very wonderful may i now invite dr ajit to read out the citation please thank you professor nirja patla for a very informative very practical talk on cervical elimination cervical cancer elimination ekcu ji 2021 dr tangam oration memorial oration citation this is to certify that dr nirja fatla badla professor of obstetrics and gynecology aims new delhi has been conferred dr tangam memorial oration for the year 2021 on the topic cervical cancer elimination training a promise into reality which she delivered at the conference by bestowing this oration on her we acknowledge not only her continued contribution to the field of gynecology oncology but also for being a beacon of light for members of varied organizations to explore to comprehend and dedicate the discoveries for the overall patient care wishing her many more years of academic excellence dated this the 10th day of april 2021 signed by dr k ambujam president of kerala federation of obstetrics and gynecology and dr m venugopal secretary of kerala federation of obstetrics and gynecology thank you professor nirja batla thank you very much i am really humbled and honored hopefully deliver the uh, medallion in the next possible opportunity <laughs> hand over to you or send it to you i think i will like to have an opportunity to come and take it oh, welcome 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 yeah, really if you get you here madam this citation will reach you by mail and as okay. shekhar sir has promised we will we hope to meet you very soon and we wish you uh, the best in your academics as well as health madam hope you are safe we are listening that cases are increasing and becoming worse in your place yes. hope you are remaining safe thank you so much for being with us now we are coming to the last part of this oration we had two wonderful orations just now we thank the esteemed faculty and our dear chairpersons for being here with us we thank our technical team medcon as well as our sponsors abbot and also the delegates who are listening to us venu sir shall we wind up this session now definitely thank you deepti thank, thank you sir thank you thank you thank you till we meet tomorrow thank you all thank you thank you good night